So today we're going to be doing like this sort of Welsh road trip, but instead of going to places like Snowdonia and uh, the coasts and the beaches, uh, I'm hoping to visit more Republican places. And to my American subscribers, Republicanism isn't George Bush, it's not the GOP. Republicanism originating over in Europe simply means to live without a king. And so that's actually in Europe more identified with a left-wing movement. And although this monument behind me, the uh, uh, monument in Silmary, uh, Llewellyn the Last Monument, isn't directly related to that, it's a good place to start because this is sort of the center, especially modern day, of Welsh separatist movements and a Welsh Republican movement that want to live without the English monarchy. Uh, specifically, this is memorializing the last Welsh prince. Now, the Prince of Wales that we have today is not related to any Welsh, uh, Welsh bloodline. The last Welsh royal uh, family that was official was the guy behind me, Llewellyn. Uh, from 1282 is when he was killed around this area in a battle with the English monarchy. And since then, you have had a succession of princes that were all descended from the British royal family, and that has actually kind of pissed off some of the um, more Welsh Republican locals who disagree with the sort of investiture and the uh, ceremonies that they hold inside of Welsh castles. They think that it's a sort of co-opting of Welsh history and trying to rewrite it and bring it into British history. So that's uh, an interesting bit of history and uh, every year on the day that uh, this prince died there is a memorial, almost looks like uh, a Sinn Féin memorial. They march from the pub in town just a quarter mile down the street, the Llewellyn uh, pub, and they have their flags and their uniforms and their drummers and they march up here and they fly the flag of the Free Will's Army and the Welsh flag. And the Free Will's Army, along with a few other groups, we're going to start exploring on the next stop in the ride. So I just thought that was an interesting bit of history. So. This is the name of a member of the Free Wales Army movement. I don't speak Welsh, but I'm going to leave this back at the memorial. I just want to see what it says. Never forgotten. So I actually had no idea that this well was here, but supposedly this is where uh, Prince Llewellyn washed before this final battle. And British holy wells are very interesting because there's so much religious symbolism to them. Look how clear the water is. <clears throat> this is an interesting memorial to visit. We're in the town of Celian, uh, which is sort of a snapshot in the history of the Free Wells Army. This was the town where the leader of the, the Free Wales Army was born, John K.O. Evans. And behind me is a memorial to the Abergill Martyrs. Now, the Abergill Martyrs were a part of MAC, which itself was not a part of the Free Wales Army. And, um, however, they were Welsh separatists, they were Republicans, and this kind of became a rallying call. Now, I can identify five different factors that led up to Welsh Republican uh, insurrectionary activities. Uh, one was the uh, lack of representation. The Welsh people wanted a parliament and they wanted to have some sort of autonomy, which eventually they were granted. Two was the marginalization of their language. Uh, I can kind of draw some similarities between the way Welsh language was treated and the way Lakota language and Indian language was treated in the States. Uh, in the schools, the uh, Welsh people were told not to speak Welsh language. In fact, they were punished if they spoke it. Um, after that, you have the flooding of a valley that had a traditional village in it that spoke Welsh. And this is what really kicked off the Republican movement in Wales. Uh, the flooding of this valley was seen as a move by Britain against Wales. Uh, it's Britain had years to call off this movement because by now the Welsh had political representation in Parliament and they had played Cymru, which was the Party of Wales. Uh, and everybody in the Party of Wales 
Nobody wanted this because it would flood the valley and it would siphon the water off to Liverpool, which wasn't even a Welsh city. And this would destroy Welsh cultural heritage. And they were universally against it. So in this period of time, uh, there was a split within Plaid Cymru. And a lot of members were saying, well, if pacifism and, you know, political bureaucracy isn't working, shouldn't we take the direct action? And they flooded the valley and they started building construction sites and that's when you started seeing some of this insurrectionary activity. Bombing the pylons, uh, spiking the, the trees around the area. And this is what kind of really started the movement rolling. Uh, after that, you had uh, the, the valley was flooded and then investiture was happening. So investiture was, like I mentioned at the Llewellyn Memorial, uh, they weren't, the, the Welsh didn't like uh, history being rewritten and Welsh princes, you know, being sworn in in a Welsh castle. So the Abergale martyrs are a direct result of this fourth point. Uh, they were constructing a bomb and planning to derail the train which was headed to investiture to hopefully bring it to a halt. And in 1969, this bomb exploded while they were working on it, killing two people. Uh, I would visit their graves, but that's in North Wales, and I'm going to be doing that at a later date, hopefully to visit that site. But uh, these people were seen as martyrs. And then the fifth point was British people were moving in because they saw the Welsh way of life. They saw the rural uh, living, and they kind of wanted that for themselves. And they were buying these homes, and because the Welsh people were a very uh, traditional uh, traditional culture, a lot of them didn't have a lot of money. So these British people were buying the homes and making it almost impossible to live uh, as a Welsh person with the, the rising cost of living. So you had these groups like Mac, like the Free Wales Army, burning down British townhouses, lighting off small bombs. It was like the uh, weather underground in America. They never really, I believe they never really intended to hurt any person. This was purely a political message and it was made to scare people, but not to directly hurt anybody. They never took a shot at a politician. They never took a shot at anybody in specific. They would try to burn their house down or some shit, but they never actually took to a full IRA uh, escalation of violence. Uh, purely political movement and uh, behind me you can see the memorial to them. It says, uh, it's just in memory of the Abergale martyrs who died in 1969. And again, this town is uh, the town where the leader of the Free Wales Army, John K.O. Evans, was born and died. And I'll get more into his history because he is sort of a war hero, but uh, just, he honestly seems like kind of a fun guy. Uh, this memorial behind me, uh, you can also see some interesting flags. Uh, I'll put a translation in the, the bottom of the description. But if we take a look here, we can see a photo of K.O. Evans. This is the, if I can move up here. And K.O. Evans is right here in the background. And you can tell that it's kind of upkept pretty well. Right behind me and sort of adjacent to the memorial, which is right to my side, is the mansion where K.O. Evans grew up in. And again, I'll go more into K.O. Evans' history uh, at his gravesite, which is also in Celian. But he was born uh, in this house and he raised horses. And uh, uh, as he grew up, he started to take on a more uh, these ideas of Welsh republicanism and Welsh separatism and sort of became a hero to this niche movement of Welsh patriots, uh, they would call themselves. And uh, it's just interesting to see this kind of obscure part of history, which most, obviously, almost no Americans know about it. Few Welsh people even know about it. But uh, an interesting sort of paramilitary movement. So this is the church where K.O. Evans is buried, and if anybody ever gets the chance to visit Wales, especially southern Wales, you should check out uh, 
the, this small town, Stilion, because the Free Wheels Army Memorial is right down the road, as is his mansion. And this is the town where he grew up. And the church behind me is the town where he's buried. And a little ways down, about maybe an hour away, is the grave of Dennis Coslett, which was another man who was active in the Free Wheels Army. And uh, then we're going to be seeing, hopefully, the grave of uh, Dick Pendaren and some, uh, some Chartist memorials. So that'll be interesting. I'm here by the grave of Julian K. O. Evans, who died in 1995. And this was the leader of the Free Wales Army. And interesting that he started as a normal man. His father, John K.O. Evans, who died in the late 1950s, was the sheriff of a local town. He came from an educated family. And he was called off to fight in the Malayan emergency in the 1950s. This was a insurgency of communist guerrilla fighters in the uh, Malaysian the area of Malaysia, and uh, in the 1960s he started to become radicalized, K.O. Evans. And this was only made worse by the flooding of that town, which I've already discussed, which I hope to visit someday uh, with the Abergale Martyrs. And he created the Free Wales Army, and him along with Dennis Coslett, who sort of militarized it. They started doing military drills. But again, these people were, uh, they were mostly just toying with the media because they would have, I think Evans himself once said uh, when they asked him about his guns and supposed explosive stockpiles, which he referenced, uh, he was trying to make the image of the IRA, but he wasn't that evil. And he, he remarked that uh, he thought that there were some rural country living museums that would have loved to get access to his guns, meaning he had access to ancient, you know, six shooters and, and pistols and a couple of rifles, but not, it wasn't like uh, AR-15s and M-16s and whatever. Uh, and the movement kind of became inactive in the late 1960s, 1970s. But again, this was involved in the burning down of townhouses <clears throat> burning down of British townhouses and uh, the sort of activism that was advocating for an independent Wales. Uh, just thought it was a bit of an interesting history and hopefully after this we'll take a look at the uh, grave of Dennis Coslett who was buried with a, apparently a military honor guard from the Free Wales Army and uh, one of the most recent deaths from this group and uh, hopefully after that we'll see some other Welsh sites because a lot of people don't realize that the Soviet Union and, and China and a lot of these communist movements, they sort of idolized Wales because Karl Marx himself was in Britain and in the 1830s the Welsh Chartist movement was taking off and the uh, murder rising and uh, was the first actual example of political groups using the red flag for an expressly political purpose. So communism and insurrectionary groups has a long history in Wales, a history that people don't really realize. The Welsh have a very interesting uh, backstory, political uh, overtones to them that people just forget about. And especially modern day, people associate separatism in the British Isles with uh, the Scottish and with the, the Northern Ireland uh, in the Troubles. But people don't realize that Wales for decades had this political movement behind them. And I think it's interesting to kind of shed light on that again because very few people ever visit these sites or memorials. And I just thought that I would show you guys these and uh, put links to them in the description. So I'm here at the uh, churchyard near the coast for the grave of Dennis Coslett, which I haven't really been able to find, but uh, I'm, I'm going to look for it for a few minutes and then leave. He was the second com in command of the Free Wales Army, and K.O. Evans started the Free Wales Army, but Coslett is the one who brought military discipline to it. People joked around with him and called him uh, Moshe Coslett because he had a glass eye and put uh, an eye patch over it, which made him look like a total, you know, rebel. And he actually wrote Rebel Heart, but uh, he's known for being involved in a police raid in which nine members of the Free Wales Army were thrown in jail. And through the entire 53-day trial, Coslett refused to speak any English. He only spoke Welsh. So he was doled out, uh, I, I believe, a 15-month prison sentence or uh, something around that line. And uh, he got out, he started writing poems and essays, 
and uh, he uh, wrote Rebel Heart, which is, uh, he got a real good picture of himself for the cover, but again, he was the second in command of the Free Wales Army, and uh, it's still, you can still see traces of it back at the Llewellyn the Last Memorial on, er on every anniversary of uh, the death of the Prince, the Free Wales Army, or at least people coming out there with flags of the Free Wales Army uh, to show support. And uh, he's kind of, he was a kind of a folk hero. Uh, in 2004, uh, hundreds of people showed up for his funeral. And he was given an honor guard with uh, people wearing berets and uh, camo. And it was almost like an IRA funeral. And I believe I read an article somewhere saying that the cops showed up expecting them to do uh, a rifle salute to him, but that never really happened. And uh, just an interesting, obscure Welsh folk hero that's kind of uh, fading into oblivion through history. So I'm here in uh, the town of Murther Tidefell to kind of explain a little bit of very interesting history. A lot of people don't know the history of communism. Actually, when you, when you think of communism, you think of Soviet military parades in North Korea and Vietnam, but a lot of people don't realize that it had a real start here in England and in Western Europe, and actually in 1831, where I'm standing in this very town, it was the first instance of the red flag being used as a symbol of insurrection and as an explicitly political symbol. Uh, in 1831, this town was uh, filled with miners. It was uh, a place for farmers to go when they saw the Industrial Revolution happening, and they figured that they could get rich quickly and easily in a town like this. And behind me is the ironworks owned by a very flamboyant William Crawshay who actually built a castle in the area just to live in overlooking the mine just so he could watch his workers slave away 16, 20 hours a day. And in 1831, you had the Chartist movement going on, which was demanding universal suffrage and shorter political terms so that, in their words, it would be impossible to bribe a politician who got reelected every year or who faced elections every year. Uh, so in this weird climate, political climate, Karl Marx was actually in England at the time, and he was the one who made observations on the social structure. And this social structure, uh, you have to remember this is completely different from modern day, because back then there was no middle class. You had haves and you had have-nots. And these miners were have-nots, and a lot of them were very angry, disillusioned military men who formed their own militias. And they marched down to this mine, I believe in June, and uh, they started making demands. And they demanded to they, they demanded an end to this place in town called the Court of Requests. And this was a private court. This was not a government-run court. It was a court run by goons from William Crawshay's mine. And basically what would happen is, if you were a mine worker, these goons would say, you owe us this much money for some arbitrary reason. You were caught uh, being lazy on the job, and now you owe us this much money. And then they would also overcharge you for services in the mine, and they would overcharge you because you live in a company town. They would charge you for your, your kids going to school and for lodging, and everybody was in debt. And this court of requests was basically a slave factory. It would make people uh, indentured to the mine. And also, the mine would not pay them in normal currency. The same thing happened in the U.S. with the Ludlow Massacre. They would pay them money that's only redeemable at the company shop. So it was a prison town. They were stuck here. And they went down to the quarter request and they demanded their buddies be let free. And they were chanting. There were thousands of men, uh, 10,000. They slaughtered a sheep and they dipped the cloth in the sheep's blood to make the red flag, which later became identified as a symbol of insurrectionary communism, which these people, I don't think that you could argue they were communists at the time, but Karl Marx took a lot of inspiration from these guys. And they marched into town shouting, uh, cheese and bread, which meant we're tired of being poor and eating porridge, uh, feed us and treat us like humans. And they went to the quarter requests and the Crawshay goons basically said, go home. And I was kind of ballsy, a couple dozen guys telling thousands of people to go home. And they didn't go home. They came to this mine and they convinced the miners to stop their mining. And uh, it was chaos. For months, this town was just owned by these miners and it spread throughout the country. 
and the entire country was uh, not not country all areas of Wales miles and miles of countryside were under the control of these guys and they were they had military formations they were marching through the countryside and uh, we weren't able unfortunately to see the grave of Dick Pendaren because I, I mixed up driving and the addresses but uh, at the end of this riot you had two main people and they tried to storm because authorities withdrew into a hotel and it was surrounded by the military and that was the sole refuge for those authorities and the rest of the miners 10,000 of them were around uh, this area controlling the town doing military movements so they brought in two divisions of uh, military members and 450 soldiers started taking aim at the crowd and they opened fire on these basically up until now peaceful protesters they hadn't hurt anybody they had threatened it because they were mad at William Crochet for living in a castle while these people literally lived in mud uh, so the soldiers opened fire and a man named Lewis Lewis and his son Dick Pendaren were charged with attempted murder Lewis Lewis was charged with trying to uh, beat to death one of the soldiers but it later came out that he jumped on top of the soldier and shielded him to protect him from an angry mob because he was firing again into a mob of unarmed protesters and then Dick Pendaren in the scuffle grabbed one of the soldiers guns because the soldier again he was shooting into the crowd dozens of people died here and uh, grabbed the rifle and it stabbed the soldier in the leg and for that they sentenced both of them to die uh, they sentenced both of them to die uh, Lewis Lewis was let off uh, because again it came clear that he was protecting the soldier and the soldier said please don't kill him he saved my life uh, but it became clear that the sheriff wanted someone to die so that this would never happen again but it did happen again and we'll explore that a little bit later so he killed Dick Pendaren uh, Dick Pendaren is buried on the coast I'll post some pictures of his grave uh, that I found online and uh, he was hanged and his last words was oh Lord this is iniquity and this was the end of one chapter in the history of British insurrection and this was also the beginning I would argue of Welsh cultural identity this town is it should be sort of a symbol and a pilgrimage for people interested in politics but it's never become that it's there's like a, a small music festival here once a year uh, that kind of tells the story but it's not much and uh, you can imagine on the hills around here the sort of just imagine military men marching up in those hills 